So we're going to solve. These are all first order, so your parameter of your family of solutions will have one parameter. They should have one parameter. So we're looking for a one parameter family of solutions because they're first order. So first one, two, x dx equals nine, y squared dy. So this one is already separated out. So all we need to do is integrate. So we're going to integrate both sides and then uh, solve for y. So go ahead and solve this one right now. Anti-differentiate both of these. Which step? It's actually one that you didn't show. Um, where you put plus C on the left side and or plus C1 on the left side and plus C1. Oh, if I skipped it, then yes, you can skip it. Do as I say, not as I do. No, do as I do. <laughs> now, generally, I'm going to skip more steps than you probably want to skip as you're first starting out. So, what I show is probably a minimal amount of steps. So cube root everything, and the good news is cube root does not need a plus minus. Oh, I don't know how my C turned into a three. C. Now you could rewrite the minus C part as minus C over three. Oh, that's a bad three. And then you could rename C over 3 as C1 or something like that. So you can always do these rename of constants. But I think this is good enough right here for our y equals. All right, that's the first one. How do you check this? So this one's a little bit funky in the original. There's no y prime in the original. So how do I rewrite this with a y prime if I actually wanted to check? This form is a little better for solving than checking. How do I take the original and rewrite it so there's a y prime somewhere? Divide by dx. Divide by dx. So I need a dy dx if I want to see where y prime goes. So I don't really have dy dx, but I can make it. I'm just going to divide everything by dx. Now I've put it together, and if you're preferring to write in primes, there's the differential equation written out in primes. So you should be able to change the form around a little bit of your differential equation. So one form's a little better for solving, separable, another one's better for checking. <coughs> so that is the first question. We'll go to the next problem. This be example two. Solve square root one minus x squared plus square root five plus y times dy dx equals zero. So now we do have to spread out the dy dx. We have to move the dx over this time. So we'll go ahead and solve this one. You unfortunately can't just square everything. So if you want to try to get clever with algebra, you can. 
So I think the first step is definitely spread out the dx. So we have x's and y's separated. You could subtract. What's the problem with squaring both sides here? It'll make the square roots disappear. But what's the really bad thing about squaring both sides? Squaring yeah, you're going to square your dx dy. So you don't want to do that. If it wasn't for those two, I could square the rest and then have a much nicer equation. So <coughs> resist the temptation to square both sides here. You need to integrate instead. I think the left-hand side integral is a little bit more tricky. How in the world did we do square root 1 minus x squared? Trig sub. Trig sub. So see if you can remember which trig sub we used and if you can actually do that. The, the y integral is not difficult. You just do a little u sub and you're there. The y integral is very straightforward. Yeah, 1 minus sine squared is cos squared. Yeah. So I could just start on the use up there. Or I shouldn't say u sub, I should say trig sub, not u sub. So we got the square root problem out of the way. How in the world do we integrate cosine squared? Do the <coughs> one plus cos two theta over two. Yep, so this is a calc one. One of the last things we did in calc one, this is the, what do we call it? Is it double? It's, like, it's not quite double or half, but it's related to double half angle formulas. So we know cos squared is 1 half 1 plus cos 2 theta. And if we had sine squared, it would be 1 half 1 minus cos 2 theta. So these are, I think they're called the power reduction formulas or something like that. So as integral, we'll put the 1 half outside, 1 plus cos 2 theta d theta. There's a one half theta plus a half sine two theta. I'm just going guessing and checking here. What's the antiderivative of cosine two theta? It's probably sine two theta. And then there'll be some constant multiple. So you can just check. I just guessed and then check. And unsub, unfortunately, Theta and sine two theta don't have nice unsubstitutions. So the best I can do for theta, I'm going off what I wrote here. Sine inverse x equals theta. So I can take out theta and put sine inverse x in its place.
You can simplify this that I underlined the sine of 2 sine inverse, but it's a little bit funky. I don't want to go that deep into trig right now. So let's not go ahead and simplify that. You can solve for y without too much. It's a lot of writing, but not a huge amount of algebraic effort. Just subtract c, multiply by negative 3 halves, and then take the proper root. So do those steps, you solve for y. But I don't think we'll gain anything by solving for y right now. So third problem. So this doesn't appear to be separable immediately. The x's and the y's are sort of mixed together. What algebra can I do to get rid of the cosine y here and to get rid of that square root over there? What algebraic operation do I do to get rid of cos y? Too many brain cells being activated. Divide by cos y. Yeah, it'll make it appear somewhere else, but it will stop it from appearing where I've underlined it. That's the whole point. So I need to, I, I see dx right here, so I need to have all the not x out of here. Yeah, so we also have to get rid of that square root x plus 1, so we'll do the same trick. Divide by that x plus 1, square root x plus 1. The good news is, you're multiplying these on the right side by 0. So the right side is going to be 0 no matter what. That's not going to change. So integrate both of these. I'll give you a hint for both of them. They're u subs. Different u sub, obviously, for each one. x plus 1 is not going to do any good for the y antiderivative. So pick a u sub for each and go for it. <coughs> and so I don't have problems with letters. I'll do a w sub on the second one, so I'm not reusing u to mean two different things at the same time. So what's the choice for the x antiderivative? So what is my u sub for the first antiderivative? x plus 1. X plus one. The only other reasonable thing to try would be square root x plus 1. There's not any other reasonable choice to make. What about my w substitution? Should I go with sine y or cos y? Cos y. So I'm going to go with cos y because basically dw will be sine y dy. I say basically because there might be a negative sign in there. Would it be a bad idea to simplify that to tangent? Uh, you could, but you're going to have to come right back to this unless you have the antiderivative tangent written down on your paper, which is ln of something. Secant. Secant, yeah. So if you know it, you just write it down. If not, this is how you do it.
So when we're doing this u sub in the x antiderivative, what does x turn into? You can't just leave it like this. You can't mix two variables together. That is correct. So when you go to use, you have to go all the way to use. You can't just go, ah, oh, some stuff will be u and some will leave an x. So if we carefully solve for x, we see x is u minus 1. So there we go. Just solve for x and plug in u minus 1. So the second integral is pretty easy. Negative ln absolute value of w. We'll put the constant on the right side when we anti-differentiate. So it'll be negative ln of cos, cos y. How in the world do we integrate the first one? u over your square root u minus 1 over u du. So I know <laughs> minus 1 over u du. That's easy. That's natural log antiderivative. What about u over square root u? It's just u to the 1 half. <laughs> yep, so algebra, u to the 1 half. So if calculus doesn't work, remember, don't forget, you should know algebra. Uh, isn't the 1 still over a square root u? Yeah. 1 over, yep. So that is minus u to the minus 1 half. There we go. And now we can add 1 to the power, u to the 3 halves, minus u to the 1 half, 3 halves. All right. Turn these into reciprocals, two thirds. U was something one x plus one. I could solve for y, but I'll have to add the natural log to the other side, take the natural log inverse, and then take cosine inverse. So it'll look like cosine inverse of e to some crazy power if I went all the way. So we'll just leave it in this form. All right, last separable problem. Speak number four. And we'll have an initial condition of y of 2 equals 0. And remember, usually one initial condition is going to get rid of one or figure out one uh, initial parameter. So I should get a value for my constant here when I apply my initial condition. So your final answer should be x's and y's and numbers only, no constant.
Now I don't have to solve for y to find my constant. I can find my constant by just plugging in x, y values here. And in fact, it's already solved for c. So there's really no reason to rearrange it if I'm trying to find the constant value. So let's read our initial condition. It says y of 2 equals 0. What does that mean? Which one is the x value? Is it 2 or 0? Two. The x value would be 2 and the y value would be 0. So it's written in the form, uh, here's the x and there's <coughs> the actual y. So if you write it as a point, it looks like 2, 0. So we're going to plug in 2 for x, 0 for y. Uh-oh. Uh, not good for the 1 over y. Well, that's the value. It's the y coordinate that I'm worried about. All right, let's just go uh, ln or y of 2 equals 1. We'll just change that number. There we go. That eliminate the divided by zero issue. So ln of 1 is 0, so our constant is negative 2. Oh, I don't need to scroll up that far. There's our original 1 minus x minus ln 1 minus x minus 1 over y equals negative 2. And there's our solution. So this one's not too bad for find, finding y prime. I think one of the other ones we had solved was way worse for finding, solving for y. Uh, Wolfram will do algebra for you. You just type an equation and then solve for y, and it should solve for y for you. So you should know the steps to do it, but if you get it wrong, don't be afraid to use Wolfram to do solve for y. Or you could type in the equation and say, what is y prime? It'll differentiate and then solve for y prime. So it can do quite a bit for you for checking. So that's the end of this section. And we're going to go to uh, the next section, which is first order ODEs with homogeneous coefficients. Uh, we'll start out with the definition. I'm trying to leave this page up while I talk about the next section so you have time to uh, write down whatever last stuff you have not written down yet. All right, definition. So the only thing new that we need to find, we know first order. It's got y and y prime, but not y double prime. So that's first order, homogeneous coefficients. So we just really need to define homogeneous coefficients. So we have We'll start out with z equals some function of x and y. And this defines a function in a region R, which is going to be a subset of two-dimensional space because our function f takes two-dimensional inputs. So. The domain of F is some part of two-dimensional space. So this little F function is homogeneous homogeneous of order n if 
it can be written as either x to the n times g of u, where u equals y over x. And the second way it could be written is a very similar way with y's. So y to the n times h of u, where this time u is x over y. So if you could write f as one of those two forms, then you have a homogeneous function. So we're going to try to show this function is homogeneous. Now, this definition, if f can be written in one of these two forms. So one of the problems with this type of definition is maybe I can't write it in one of these two forms. It doesn't mean that nobody else can write it in one of these two forms. So this, it can be written as, is a a little bit misleading, it means if it is possible that somebody could turn it into this form. Not if you can turn it into the if you can't turn it into this form, it's not homogeneous. That's not the definition of homogeneous. Alright, so I want to show this is homogeneous. So we could pick which version should we be going for? And I'll give you a big hint. Look at y over x. So it looks like we should be going the first way, y over x. So we're going to try, let's call that first way, and that's the second way. We're going to try with the first way, u equals y over x. So certainly you can see the ln y over x is going to be ln of u. I'll turn it to ln of u. But what about the rest of this? So we're going the first way. The other thing to notice, there's an x to the n power. Don't think too hard about this. What number do you think n is? Two. Two. Okay, so it looks like n is two. So fxy equals x squared, hopefully, g of u. So all I need to do is figure out what function is g of u. So we, we will factor an x squared out. That's exactly what we have to do. We have to do that carefully. I don't see an x squared in the second term. So, you just divide x squared by n. so we'll force factor right here. So what do I mean by forcing a factoring? So we did this uh, at some point. Pre-cal 1, I know I did it for sure. Probably pre-cal 2 and a few other times. I think I wrote it as maybe ax plus b is a x plus b over a. So you're factoring out something that's not there. So I want to factor out a, but oh, there's no a over there. It's fine. I'll just divide by a. So I'm doing the same thing, except now I want to factor out x squared. There's no x squared. So if I look right here. The first term gets a 1. What does the second term turn into? Y squared over x squared. Yep, y squared over x squared, ln y over x. So we're factoring out an x squared, but there wasn't an x squared in there. 
And again, this is a good time for a guess and check. So I think it'll be distribute, no problem, it is. I'm going to rewrite y squared over x squared as y over x squared. So we're almost done. So there's a few things I could do. I could so I do my use, well, I don't want to call it a use of, but my substitution for u. And we get u squared ln of u. And so it's pretty obvious at this point, what is g of u? It's that function in the parentheses right there. So we wrote it x squared times g of u. So could you write it the other way? I don't know the universal answer to this, but I uh, will say it seems like you should be able to. You'll just have to spend a lot more time doing so. Now I'm actually curious, so let's try. <laughs> So we're going to try the other uh, u equals x over y and show fxy equals y to the n and h of u. All right, so I have to factor out. Now in this case, it makes sense to probably factor out y squared. And it looked very similar. The algebra looked really similar. So first step, we'll write it as y squared. Now it'll be x over y squared plus ln y over x. So I factored out the y squared out of the first term and wrote it as x over y squared at the same time. So I skipped a step. On the last one, do we need to show like three parts what u equals what? Uh, the answer is, uh, yes. well, it show this is homogeneous. So if I scroll up, what's the definition of homogeneous? I have to, I chose the first form, so I have to show f is this form and u, and I have to specifically write out what is g of u. So there's sort of three things I have to do. And so the answer is yeah, basically I have to do all, all three. I, Maybe I could have skipped writing this here's explicitly g of u and say, hey, look, here's a function of u because it's just all u's in the parentheses. And then when you put x squared equals x squared times this thing in u equals x squared times g of u, you're implicitly stating that that's g of u. Yeah, I'm just kind of writing out everything so it's super obvious. I was trying to figure out how much there's the actual answer. Obviously, the whole Pretty much all of it, yeah. I mean, you can, you can convince somebody with less words or less writing, but I would say this is a, a decent amount to Because when you come back and look at your work later, you're going to want to basically be able to recover what you were thinking from what you wrote. And if you don't write this and this and all you wrote is like this right here, it's a little bit harder to tell. I'd have to look back at the definition and say, oh, I'm trying to show this. Whereas if I write all this stuff out, I'll have some indication of what the actual definition looked like for uh, homogeneous. So we're almost there. I just need to rewrite the second term in terms of a function of u. Yes, yeah, so we have some problems. I got u squared, no problem. What do I put inside the natural log? Either u the negative first or 1 over u, however you want to write it. 1 over u or u to the negative first. So it's the reciprocal of what I want. So is this the right form? We got y squared times 
h of u, where the h of u function is u squared. And I can get fancy and rewrite our ln 1 over u is minus ln u, because the negative first power is a negative coefficient, negative 1 coefficient. All right, so I got that in the right form. Probably better to go with the first way than the second way, especially if we're going to be doing calculus afterwards. So I try to pick a nice way, the, uh, the nicer of the two ways to go. And generally, you'll see a y over x or an x over y. If not, it probably doesn't matter which of the two ways you went. So next example, homogeneous or not homogeneous? I just realized my notes, I don't think I have enough detail. Somebody have their book and go to chapter 7 and tell me if n has to be an integer. And if it has to be an integer, does it have to be positive? This is going to be the diff differential equations book. This other book. <laughs> they may have homogeneous definition in there, um, but I can tell you it's in chapter 7 in the right textbook. <laughs> I have a feeling it needs to be an integer. I don't know if it needs to be positive, though. Oh, they don't even say in here. That's great. They just say homogeneous of order n. Oh, down here they have a def uh, where it's order 1 half. So I guess it's OK. It doesn't have to be an integer. Usually we're just talking about orders of, or degrees of integer numbers and generally positive. But in this case, order doesn't have to be an integer. Yeah, I think, I, and I think it can be negative as well. All right, so homogeneous or not, there's no restriction on n. It needs to be a real number, but other than that, no real restriction on it. All right, I'll give you a hint for this one. What's a good choice for you? X over y. So go with that route right there. So we got homogeneous of order one half. And now for the second. Oh, this should be sine x cos y. So should I go first or second on this one? First, not because of the y over x over, x over y, but because it's x squared outside. So it's already looking like the first option. So what I need here is g of u, where u is, is it y over x, y over x.
So in this case, I don't see a way to have a function of y over x turn into sine x times cos y. I don't know of any nice function that would split up y and x and take sine of one and cos of the other. So it appears like there is not a way to do this. So I wrote the word appears to not be because maybe somebody else who's a lot smarter or has more time could show that this is homogeneous. So I only talked about homogeneous functions, not homogeneous ordinary differential equations. So what is a homogeneous ordinary differential equation? Basically, the function in front of dx and dy separately are homogeneous of the same order. So that's what it takes. The same order. They do. So we have this homogene or so this ODE Phrase this the right way. So I have the ODE where P of XY and Q of XY are both. homogeneous of order n. This is called and this ODE is a force first order homogeneous ODE. So if things weren't confusing enough, let me underline the definition. And then the reason why this vocabulary is bad. The two words order that I underlined don't mean the same thing whatsoever. So homogeneous of order n is the exponent either y to the n or x to the n that pops out. Yeah. The first order homogeneous ODE, that order refers to there's only a single derivative. There's not a double or triple or quadruple derivative. So that order is referring to first derivative only. The other order is the homogeneous order, or the exponent that you can factor out. I probably messed those two up, did I? XNGU. Yep. So G got the X, 
H got the Y. So that's referring to the uh, X and the second one got the Y. All right, so that order, the homogeneous order, is referring to the uh, power. All right, so that's definition. How in the world did we solve it? So theorem, a first order homogeneous ODE becomes separable after a substitution. ODE becomes separable after the substitution. Either u equals x over y or u equals y over x. So let's assume that we're going to pull out an x to the n. So we'll assume the first one. You can do the same proof where you basically swap the role of x and y and write it the other way around. So I'm going to assume the first of the two. They're essentially the same. The only difference is somewhere x and y trade places. That's all. So they're the exact same form, just x and y are going to trade places. That's the only difference. So we'll just assume we're in the first. Oh, no. So all I can do is tell you the theorem. You have to believe me tomorrow. You don't have to have faith anymore. <laughs>